right, church, how you guys doing today? Awesome. My name is Brad. I'm the teaching pastor here at 242, but I'm not teaching today. Uh, I am excited to be with you at all seven campuses uh, today to introduce uh, our speaker today. Uh, as you know, this whole month we've been in a series called Should Happens, and, uh, and that's based on this book uh, written by Todd Clark. Uh, Todd is a friend of ours here at 242. He's a pastor in the Chicagoland area. He actually lives in California, and so he flew in here and wanted to go home as soon as he could. Uh, and he saw the snow, but uh, he's trapped now. So, uh, but he's going to be here today. He's excited to bring the word. God really put this whole book on his heart. So if you've, if you've responded to anything throughout this whole series, just know God's working through him to give that to us, to you. And so we get to hear it straight from him today at all seven of our campuses. So I'm excited about that. So would you please do me a favor and just give a warm 242 welcome to our friend, Todd Clark. Uh, oh man, that's so good, Brad, thank you. Thanks for the warm uh, welcome uh, too, appreciate that. 242, glad uh, that you are around here this weekend. And I uh, just wanna say uh, hello to all of our campuses uh, as well. And uh, I know we have three new campuses kicking off there in Taylor and Monroe. And I think I'm gonna say it right, L Livonia. Is that right, Livonia? Livonia, we love you guys. I'm so, I'm just, I'm excited for these new campuses and to see what God is going to do with you all and in you and through you uh, in the next few months and the next few years. Thanks for being a part uh, of this weekend. And uh, we are wrapping up uh, this series called Should Happens. And uh, I'm, I'm super excited to be with you wrapping up uh, this series. And I want you to know that, that I personally have, have wrestled with the shoulds for most of my life. Uh, at least most of my adult life. And what I've discovered in the last few years of writing about this and thinking about the shoulds is that really we all wrestle with the shoulds. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're 16 years old or 36 years old or 76 years old. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you come to church a whole lot or this is your first weekend back in church in a long time. The shoulds are something that we all feel the weight and the pressure of what we should and should not be doing in our lives. And so what we've been doing in this series is uh, we've been taking a look at the shoulds through the lens of the Bible, through God's word. And we're finding freedom and we're learning how to move from a should life to a good life. And so I'm glad you're here to wrap it up uh, together. Happy to be here with you uh, this this weekend. And I want you to know also something else, uh, just real quickly here, about the books that are all around our campuses the last few weeks. Uh, th this book uh, is, it, it, it took me about eight years of my life to write. And so I'll probably never write another one. Uh, it's very difficult to write a book. And I, I just want you to know uh, my heart behind uh, this book is to help people come back to God. And also, I've had a heart for a long time to feed. Kids, And so I've had some photography stuff going on for the last seven or eight years of life through this thing called Eat Art, and we've been able to send hundreds of thousands of meals to kids all around the world. And so now through this book project, that's the desire with the book as well, that one book will feed one child for one week. So if you pick up a book, if you have already picked up a book, I think we have about 300 left around all of our campuses this weekend. Man, I'd love for us to knock those out and feed all these kids. Thank you, thank you for partnering in that. That's a huge part, huge part of my heart. Thank you, thank you, awesome. Glad we're in on that. Now, okay, let's get going here. So if you haven't been around the last few weekends of the series, uh, just to make sure we all know what the shoulds are, we'll put this up here on the screen for you. The shoulds are the expectations that we place on ourselves, on others, and on God. And over the last few weeks in this series, We've discovered several things about the shoulds. First of all, we've discovered that oftentimes we should on ourselves. We, we put expectations on ourselves. And here's the way it works for me. If someone asks me to do something, and, and I think about saying no to them. So somebody asked me to take them to the airport or, or help them move, or even someone asked me to go get coffee or something like that, and I even think about saying no to them, there's immediately like this courtroom convened in my mind. And I begin to put myself on trial as to all the reasons I should do what they're asking me to do, right? 
I should on myself and put expectations on myself all the time. That was the very first week of the series. A couple weeks ago, we talked about how we should on other people. And the way that works is uh, most all of us have these secret job descriptions for pretty much everyone in our lives. Uh, the idea is that we have all these expectations of all kinds of people in our lives, but the fact is they don't know about it. They're secret. So they pretty quickly fail to live up to our expectations of them. And when they fail to live up to our expectations, we should on them. We put expectations and things on these folks. And then just last weekend, we talked about how others should on us. And here's the truth of that. We all, every single one of us, on all of our campuses, we all have people in our lives, good people, God-loving people, friends and family, and they have all kinds of things they believe we should do, right? And a lot of them are good shoulds. How many of you know there's such thing as good shoulds? There's things that you and I should do. No doubt about it, but here's the problem. You and I, we don't have enough time in our day or our week or our month to even do all the good shoulds that everybody has for us. So what do we do when all these people have these shoulds for our lives? How do we live our life and what God is calling us to live, not just the life of others? And so last weekend, we went to the Bible and we unpacked how we can begin to navigate the shoulds of other people in our lives. And so that brings us to this weekend, the last should of them all. And I want you to know that our study today, this is the reason that the person that you go to school with makes jokes about God. What we're gonna study today is the reason your neighbor says they're an atheist. What we're gonna study this weekend is why your husband or wife or one of your friends or one of your kids or one of your grandkids, it's why they quit going to church. It's why they said see ya to church. Here's why. It's because every single one of us, at some point in our life, at some season of our life, has had God act in a way that we don't think he should. And when that happens, we should on God. Shoulding on God, listen, th this is not a religious thing that we're talking about. It's not a Christian thing. Having shoulds for God and expectations for God is a human thing. Every single person on this planet believes they know how God should act. And you know, if I do this, God should do this, right? I mean, if I do this, God has to do this. And then a lot of times he doesn't. And so what do we do? We place shoulds on God. A few examples of this in our lives. Maybe someone in your family over the course of the last few years, one of your parents, one of your kids, grandkids, has been sick. And so they get pretty sick, and so you end up taking them to the doctor, to the hospital, and you think they're just kind of have a really bad cold or something like that, and you find out after a few tests are run that it's not just a really bad cold, there's something much deeper, and it's some sort of cancer. And as soon as you find that out, and the cancer word with anybody, we immediately, of course, start praying, right? for our family, for our, for our friends, and, and maybe you've been there in, in your life, and you get your whole family praying, and, and you get the whole church, all 242 is praying, and, and then people all throughout the country start praying. It seems like the whole world is praying for your family member, for your mom or dad or kid or grandkid. I mean, they have to get better, right? A few months go by and maybe a year. A lot of you have experienced this and they don't get better. Maybe they pass away. And when that happens, it's easy to have the conversation with God. God, what's that about? They were like one of the best people I've ever known. They were so loving and loved you so much. God, you, you should have helped them. You should have healed them. And it's so easy to have these kinds of conversations with God and what he should do. Or let's bring it more here uh, to where we are this weekend. Let's say you've been looking for a new job for like the last six months or the last 12 months, and, and you kind of have this agreement with God, right? This is what we do. God, here's the thing. <clears throat> if I do my part, you have to do your part, okay? And so you feel like you've been doing your part to get a new job, and you put together a great resume, and it's in color, and it has photos, and you've been going to like interviews like crazy. Every week you're going to several interviews, so you feel like you're doing your part. 
But yet, you still don't have a decent job. And you start thinking, God, God, listen, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All I'm trying to do is provide for my family, okay? You, sh you should be helping me with this. And it's easy to have those expectations on God. Or what about this? Uh, maybe uh, you're around here today, this weekend, and you're single. Any, any single folks around 242? Okay, yeah, a few. Uh, take, take a look around the room, right? Single people, notice that, okay? Well, let's say you're single, and for the last like one year or three years or five years, here's, here's what you've decided as a single person. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna remain pure. And I, I'm gonna keep my uh, you know, expectations uh, high. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep just my morals high and, and, and pure as, as I date people in my life. I'm just gonna keep these standards super high. And here's the agreement. God, if I do that, if I stay pure, and God, if I keep my standards high, then you owe me, right? You owe me somebody to date. You owe me somebody to get engaged to and get married to. And so maybe you feel like you've been keeping up your part, you've been keeping your standards high, but yet so far you have no prospects. You have really nobody there. And, and what I want us to realize is that all of us make these private packs and contracts with God in our mind. And God, everyone is praying, you should heal my mom or dad or one of our kids. God, I'm working to get a job. You should help me get a job. God, I'm staying pure. I'm keeping my standards high. You owe me a fiance, right? Who's like good and super holy and super hot, right? That's what you owe me. And by the way, God, if you're not gonna act like you should, then I'm out. I'm out on this. And we walk out on church a lot of times, we walk out on faith, because when we don't understand God, a lot of times we begin to should on God. And here's what I want us to realize this weekend. Here's what I want us to realize. This is, this is so huge. This truth that I'm getting ready to share with you, this could save your future faith in God. This truth could save your kids or your grandkids' future faith in God. Here it is, are you ready for it? God, not acting like we think he should, is nothing new. For thousands of years, God has been doing his thing in his time, in his ways. And listen, listen, that does not mean that he doesn't care about you. Believe me, he cares deeply about you. But that does not mean he will always act like we think he should. And to get some more insight into this this weekend and to get some more foundation and dexterity in our lives, I want us to go to the Bible. So if you have a Bible, Genesis chapter 37 is where we're going to be for a while. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, however you locate scripture uh, these days, Genesis chapter 37, we're going to spend some time today taking a look at the life of Joseph. Now, Joseph is a guy, some of you probably know a lot of his story, he is a guy who could have should on God. He had a lot of reasons to should on God, but he decided to just keep trusting God even when God didn't act exactly like Joseph maybe thought he should. And because of that, Joseph was able to move from a should life to a very, very good life. And so I want us to look at several seasons and episodes of his life where he could have should on God, but he just keeps trusting him. So the first one is with his family. The family shoulds. If you're taking notes, the family shoulds. Genesis chapter 37, starting in verse three. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate coat for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now pause there for just a moment. Joseph's dad loves him more than any of the other boys, and so he makes this really cool coat for him. And if you've been around church much, you know, we talk about this being, you know, this coat of many colors, and, and there's this whole production, you know, of, about the coat of many colors and that sort of thing. And as I'm reading through that, as I'm thinking through it, you know, I, I start thinking, you know, what's the big deal about a nice coat? I don't see why the brothers are so jealous. I mean, it's good to have a coat, especially up here around Michigan. It's really good to have a coat, but I don't understand why they're so jealous, you know, about this coat. And so I've been trying to think, you know, for the last few weeks of like, how do we put this in modern terms? 
And, and so I was thinking about this. Have, have you seen this? We'll put it up on the screen here. Have you seen this? The iPhone 11. Do you know about this, right? Some of you have this iPhone 11. I don't know if you are into Apple products. Uh, I'm fairly obsessed with them, actually. And uh, so, so here, here's, here's what I'm thinking, to put it like in our terms. I'm, I'm thinking that uh, Joseph and all of his brothers... There's a lot of them. They basically have like the iPhone 5, okay? Because dad can't keep upgrading them, so they've missed a few upgrades. And so they have like, they all have iPhone 5s, you know, that are really small, you know, like they're the size of a bite-sized candy bar. They're tiny, right? Little iPhone 5s, they don't do much. And so one evening, Joseph's dad comes in, and they're all sitting around, and he has a gift for Joseph. And he says, go ahead, open it up. And so he opens it up, and inside the box is the 11, Okay. It's the 11, and he pulls it out, and it's, it's huge, you know, and, and all of his brothers are looking at their little fives, and they're thinking, what's going on? And, you know, it's got the telephoto and all that kind of stuff going on, and so he gets the iPhone 11, and not only that, his dad gets him the Apple Watch, okay, the brand new Apple Watch, and he doesn't get just, you know, the little plastic band, he gets the leather band, right, that's like from Switzerland or something like that, you know, and, and so, he, so, so here's Joseph, and he's, he's, you know, he's walking around, and he has this huge, you know, iPhone 11 sticking out of his pocket, you know, and he's talking to Siri and all that kind of stuff, and his brothers are thinking, what's going on, so they get a little bit, a little bit jealous, so that's kind of, you know, the, the, the picture of it, and then the story goes on and says that Joseph's dad sends him out into the fields because his brothers are out there taking care of some of their flocks, some of their herds. And so can you just see this? Here, here comes Joseph. He's going to go take some food to his brothers who are out in the field. And he's coming out there. He's walking out there. You know, he's got his GPS going on. He's listening to music and Siri. And he's got his phone and everything like that. And, and the brothers see him coming. And they say, hey, that's enough of this. And let, let's, let's teach him a lesson. So the Bible says they, they, they grab him. They beat him. They, they strip off his coat. They, they smash his iPhone 11. And it, actually, that, they don't do that, right? You, you understand he doesn't really have an iPhone. So don't, don't go and tell your kids this weekend, hey, did you know Joseph had an iPhone? He, he doesn't, okay? It's not in the Bible. I'm just making that up. Anyway, but they do take his coat. They, they take off his coat. And, and they take his coat. And what it says is they dip it in blood because they're going to go back and tell their dad that he's been killed. And so they take his coat, dip it in blood, and then they throw him down in this pit, to basically die. A little bit of time goes by and one of the brothers says, hey, you know what, Let, let's, they're just so kind. Let's not leave him in a pit to die. After all, he is our brother, right? So kind. Let's get him out of the pit and let's sell him as a slave, right? So, so, so much better. And so that's what they do. They, they pull him up out of the pit and they sell him to some people who are headed to Egypt. And, and I just wanna pause there and, and I wanna say and make sure we realize this. Joseph, is seriously mistreated and abused by his own flesh and blood. And family's supposed to stick together, right? I mean, what do you do when your family, who is supposed to be your biggest fans, become your biggest critics? What do you do? It hurts. And don't answer this out loud. Just, just answer this in your head. But let me ask you this. Do you ever feel like you've been thrown in a pit by your family? Have you ever had your own family act in a completely out of bounds way towards you? Where you're thinking, are you kidding me? This is the way I'm gonna be treated, God? When that happens in our lives, it's very easy to have that conversation with God. It's very easy to put the shoulds and the expectations on God. Joseph could have easily done that, but he decides just to keep trusting God, even when his family wasn't acting exactly the way they should. And so that moves him on to the next section of his life. If you're taking notes, it's the boss or the employer shoulds. The boss or employer shoulds. Joseph gets sold into slavery in Egypt, and he winds up in this house of a guy named Potiphar. Everybody say Potiphar. 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 This guy works for Pharaoh, like the king of Egypt. He's one of his guard. And Potiphar's wife uh, begins to take notice of Joseph, okay? The Bible says that Joseph is well-built and handsome, and Potiphar's wife starts to notice him. And the Bible actually says, we're not going to read it right now, but it says that she tries to get with him, seduce him several times, multiple times. In fact, one time, Potiphar's wife and Joseph are in the house, and, and she grabs a hold of him, and he's like stuck, and he, he freaks out, and he literally just, he runs out of his coat and leaves his coat in her hands. Joseph, by the way, has a bit of a problem with coats. Have you noticed this? <laughs> He's got a little coat issue going on in his life. He, he leaves it, and she, I'm sure she's upset. She's embarrassed by all this. And take a look at what happens in Genesis chapter 39. And she kept his coat or his cloak beside her until the master came home. And then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave that you brought to us, he came to me to make sport of me. 
Now, now you understand also, by the way, the sport is not like normal, like sports we're thinking. It's not like he, he wants me to play volleyball or, you know, badminton. This is more, more sexual. Okay, you got that? But, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his coat beside me and ran out of the house. And so Potiphar, his boss, finds this out. He's, he's furious with him, and he throws him in prison. And, and what I want us to see is that Joseph is just, he's just he's doing what's right. He's trying to keep his integrity. He's trying to honor God, and, and he's trying to honor his boss, his employer, by, by doing what's right. And he finds himself in a really difficult situation. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been at work and, and you're just trying to do what's right at work? You're trying to honor God at work and, and it feels like you're in hot water? Have you ever found yourself like just being honest and, and your honesty at work is potentially going to cause you to lose your job? And you find yourself saying, God, listen, I'm just trying to do what's right. I'm trying to be honorable and full of integrity. And I think because of that, I may, I may get fired. When that kind of stuff happens, it's so easy to have that conversation with God of this should not be happening. I'm trying to live for you, and yet I'm maybe going to lose this job. And the story continues on, and that is the friend shoulds, the shoulds from his friends. So it comes from his family, it comes from his boss, and, and then it comes from his friends. He gets thrown into prison, and while Joseph is in prison... He makes a couple of friends, and one of the friends is the cupbearer to the king, and the other one is the baker of the king. Uh, they're both in prison as well, and, and what happens is, is both of these guys, the cupbearer and the baker, start having these dreams, okay? And Joseph, uh, some of you may know this, but Joseph has this incredible ability to interpret people's dreams, and so he dives in and starts interpreting these guys' dreams, and they're amazed. And, and by the way, interpreting dreams is also what got Joseph into trouble with his family that we were studying just a few minutes ago. It wasn't just, you know, the coat and the iPhone 11 and that sort of thing. He was interpreting dreams. And, and here's what happened. We didn't study this, but this was just a few chapters earlier. Joseph has a few dreams, and, and these dreams are all about his brothers, his family, one day bowing down to him. That's what his dreams are about, that his brothers are going to bow down to him. Now, now those are usually the, the type of dream that, that you would keep to yourself, right? Right? But that's not what Joseph does. Joseph doesn't do that. Well, one evening, he's gathering all of his family, gathering all of his brothers around, says, hey, 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 come, come here. I, I got to tell you something. I had a cool dream last night. I've actually had a couple of these dreams, and so after I have a couple of them, I feel like I need to tell you about them. And so he pulls all of his brothers around and says, hey, you guys aren't going to believe this, but here's the dream. It was, it, was, it was phenomenal. Basically, all of you were bowing to me. It's like I'm your boss. So cool, right? And so anyway, that, they're jealous. So that's part of why they want to throw him in the pit and beat him up and all that kind of thing. So, so anyway, he has this incredible ability to interpret these dreams. He does it for his brothers. He does it for these guys, these friends of the king. And so these guys say, listen, man, when, whenever we get out of here, as soon as we get out of prison, you are so getting out of prison. We, we are so getting you out when we get out. No doubt about it, right? You are out of this place. Now, the story goes, they both get out of prison. And very quickly, the baker... Uh, the baker loses his, his head, loses his mind, actually loses his head. He gets his head chopped off, okay? That's what the Bible says. There's good stories in here. You should read it. The Bible says he gets his head chopped off. He really does. And so he's not going to be a lot of help, right? He's not going to be a lot of help to him. And so it goes on to the next guy. And check this out, Genesis chapter 40, verse 23. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Continues on, when two full years had passed, so he gets out of prison, and then they forget about him for two more years. And again, don't, don't answer this out loud, just in your head, in your heart. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been forgotten by friends? Have you ever had friends promise one thing and then do something completely different? You ever had friends stab you in the back? Some of you are saying, Todd, forget, you know, stabbing me in the back. I've had friends stab me in the front, okay? It's like, that's my kind of friends. Like, kind of like Joseph. I mean, I have friends, but they're not great friends, right? And here's what I want us to know. Here's what I want us to realize from Joseph's life. That Joseph's boss, his boss didn't act the way he should, 
Joseph's family, his family certainly didn't act the way they should. His friends didn't act the way they should. Here's the thing I want us to realize. Joseph could have should on God. I think he should have should on God. Be careful saying that. I want you to know that I personally have should on God for far less. I have in my life, but here's what happens. Listen, this is so, so huge. It's a huge lesson for us. We'll put it up on the screen. Joseph decided to trust in what God could do rather than staying preoccupied with what he thought God should do. It's huge. He chose to trust in what God could do rather than just staying preoccupied with what he thought God should do. I don't know when it happened. I don't know at what point in Joseph's life he comes to this. Maybe just before the pit or maybe when he's in the pit, but at some point in his life, he just made the decision. You know what? Here's the deal. I'm just gonna trust in what God could do. I'm not gonna get all stuck and sidetracked with what I think God should do in my life. And because he decided to keep trusting God, even when he didn't completely understand God, check out what happens. Pharaoh, who's the king of all of Egypt, he starts having these dreams. And then some people start to remember, the cupbearers remembering, hey, there's this guy in prison from two years ago. He can interpret dreams. He knows all about dreams. He's a really good dream guy, okay? We should go get him. And Pharaoh says, well, go get him. I, no one else can help me with this. And so they go get Joseph and he gets out and he starts interpreting Pharaoh's dreams that no one else can interpret. And Pharaoh is blown away by what Joseph can do. And so take a look at what happens. Genesis chapter 41, starting in verse 39. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all of this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Verse 41, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. And he dressed him in robes of fine linen. And as I'm thinking through this, by the way, I like to really think out the Bible when I'm thinking about it and teaching it and studying it. And I see him, you know, dressing him in robes of fine linen. I, my, my first thought is like when all this is happening, you know, around the throne room is that Pharaoh tries to give Joseph a coat. You know, and Joe's like, no, I'm, I'm kind of out on coats. I don't really do coats anymore. But, you know, if you had a robe or something like that, I could do that. And he goes, hey, we have fine linen robes if you want a fine linen robe. And so, that's, that, you know, that's what happens. He gives him a fine linen robe and he puts a gold chain around his neck like Run DMC. And he, um, that's not in there. That's what I think. Okay, it's all in my mind. He puts a gold chain around his neck and then he has him ride around in his chariot, his second in command. And people shout it out before him, make way, make way. And thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Is that crazy? I mean, how many of you know the stories in the Bible are true? Amen? Amen. I mean, the stories in the Bible are true. This, this is unbelievable. Here's the deal. This is so huge. Joseph could have never dreamed this for his life when he was in a pit or when he was being betrayed by his boss or when he was being forgotten by his friends. He would have never dreamed this. He would have never dreamed that one day... He was going to be in charge of all of Egypt. He would have never thought that. And here's what I want you and I to realize. When you're living the story of your life, sometimes God is difficult to see. When you're living right in real time in the story of your life, sometimes it's hard to see what God is really doing and what God is really up to. It can be confusing. Well, let's just think about Joseph's life for just a moment here. Genesis chapter 37, he's in the pit, right? We've just studied that. We read about that. Genesis chapter 37, he's in the pit. Genesis chapter 41, just a few chapters later, he's in the palace and he's in charge of all of Egypt. Do you know how much time takes place between Genesis chapter 37 where he's in the pit and Genesis chapter 41 where he's in charge of all of Egypt? How much time there? 14 years. It's just a few chapters for us. 
this weekend. But it's 14 years for Joseph that he's trusting God. Listen, a lot of times for you and me, man, if God doesn't get going, I, I, I quit. You know, it's like four minutes later, I'm like, hello? Four days later, I'm like, well, he's not doing anything. He can't hear me, so I got to do this. I got to take care of things. We have trouble trusting God for just a few days. It's been 14 years. And listen, listen, when, when Joseph is in the pit, so important for us to understand and realize, when Joseph is in the pit in Genesis chapter 37 and his brothers have thrown him down there, Joseph is not sitting down there. We have a different perspective than he does. Joseph is not sitting down in the pit going, hey, hey, guess what? It's not a big deal. Because you know what? Chapter 41. <laughs> Chapter 41, I'm going to be in charge of all of Egypt. So y'all better behave. Okay? Listen, he couldn't do that. He couldn't see in chapter 37 of his life what God was going to be doing in chapter 41 of his life. Sometimes when you're living the story of your life in real time, God can be difficult to see. But listen, listen. If Joseph had quit trusting God, he would have missed out on God's great plans for his life. And here's what I need to say to you, 242. Here's what I came a long way, traveled a long way today, this weekend, to say to you. And I know I don't know all of you, not all of you know me, but here's, here's what I want you to know. Some of you, many of you are just moments away, a few days, a few weeks away from intersecting with God's great plans for your life. You're just moments away. And yes, it's true that you may feel like today, right now, you're in a pit, but that doesn't mean that you will still be in a pit tomorrow, amen? amen? You may feel like you're down and out today, but that does not mean that is where you will be tomorrow. God has great plans, I promise you. He has great plans for your life, and what he is doing in this chapter of your life, whether you're 16 or 26 or 46 or 86 years old, what he's doing in this chapter of your life right now is definitely preparing you for the next chapter of your life. And just because you and I cannot see God working in our lives does not mean he's not working in our lives. He's doing things behind the scenes in this chapter to prepare you for next chapter. And so here's what I want to ask all of us to do today, this, this weekend. I want to ask all of us, if you will, to make a decision like today. And, and, and I know you may be thinking, well, I don't know if I want to make a decision. Let me see what it is first. And I don't really make decisions on the weekend. I do decisions on Monday. Monday's my decision day. So maybe I'll do it Monday. No, no, listen. Today, today. Here's the next step. Here's the decision I would ask you to make. We'll put it up on the screen. Make a decision today. Not later this weekend, not Monday. Make a decision today to trust in what God could do rather than staying preoccupied with what you think God should do. Make a decision, 242, to trust in what God could do in your life, in your marriage, with your kids, with your grandkids, at your job, even this week. Because believe me, I just, I just, I have this idea and this thought, and I believe it's true, that if you and I could see from heaven's perspective, if we could see our lives from heaven's perspective, we would see all heaven right now looking down on us, looking down on you saying, no, 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 look. Hey, look. hey, don't quit. Don't, don't, don't stop now. Don't quit trusting God now. Because if you could see what we see from our perspective, you would see that you are just moments away from understanding the activity of God in your life. Don't stop now. Don't quit now. Keep trusting him in your life each and every day. Amen? Amen. Well, 242, I just want to say thank you so much for being a part of a series like this that has such an unconventional name and title, but thank you for diving into the shoulds and 
talking with friends and family, inviting people to come to 242 and learning how to move from that should life to the good life. Thank you so much for buying and purchasing books and feeding kids with that. And, and here's what I would ask. May we, may we be the kind of people, may we be a community of people who trust in what God could do, not just stay stuck or debating or being preoccupied with what we think God should do. Let's trust God in our lives every day. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for a time like this where we can study for a, for a, a weekend where we can <laughs> come together and carve out time to worship with music and sing and recalibrate our hearts to you. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the story of Joseph that is familiar to a lot of us in our lives, but God, thank you for just how applicable it is to our lives even today. And God, even when our family or our friends or our boss or our employer doesn't act the way we think they should, help us just to continue to trust you that you're doing something in this chapter of our lives today that will make more sense and be good for us in another chapter tomorrow or next week. God, we love you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Everyone says, amen. Amen. amen.